accomplishment, achievement, performance. Our topics besides motivation for this week's NB Networks podcast. We live in a time where you now say maybe it will get better in the near future, but also many of you might face, well, uncertainty, fear, or even anxiety or worse. What I can see, and only during the last weeks when I received the emails, when I received emails from people who were, people who were in coachings or seminars, workshops, knew me from somewhere. The emails I received, by the way, if you email me, that always stays confidential. I will never bring anything you email me up here. The emails, however, and that is something which people ask me to point out, the emails often said that they see a rise of motivational speaking amongst their, their leadership team. I can give you an example. Coronavirus breaks out, we need to have a shutdown, we are locking down the economy and we most likely face the worst uncertainties many of us, including myself, had ever. I never faced so much uncertainty like I did now. At my age, my grandparents, by the way, just to give you a bit of perspective, at my age, my grandparents lived through two world wars. So just to give you a bit of perspective of how bad we we actually are. And then, of course, you see that sometimes mentalities also kick in. I just give you an example. When you when you look in the news, and I am at home now, and I, I, I watch news from Germany, Austria, Switzerland, as you can hear by my charming accent. I am German, if you haven't heard any episodes before. I often try to uh, listen to the TF1, which is news from France. I listen with my basic Spanish to uh, the news in Spain, and of course, BBC World News. So I have, and, and of course, the American news. And it is quite interesting to see how many people re refer to Germany as a good example of how to handle a crisis. When you listen to German news, and especially to Germans by themselves, what they say is, it's all bad, it's really bad, it has, it has never been worse, we don't do well at all, it is a massive catastrophe. Nearly the whole world looks to Germany and say, we would like to be in that place, while at the same time Germans tell themselves it's all the worst they have ever experienced. That is not also a side effect of wealth when a society is very wealthy and doing quite well, which applies to the majority of people in Germany. Then, of course, the slightest change of that situation might be very threatening, although it isn't that bad. Still, that, this cannot be the reason why you suddenly stick to motivational speaking. And I, I give you an example, which I have now read multiple times in different emails, Leaders get to the office and they refer to the same story. I have no idea if there's some sort of motivational meme going around or if you went to the same motivational event, but when people from different places all around the world tell me the same story, there must be a common source somewhere where, where people just read that. Someone comes into your office and says, look, we refer to the Chinese language and in Chinese, The word crisis has two signs, and then they normally show a PowerPoint slide with these two signs on. One sign stands for crisis, the other sign stands for opportunity, or depending on the translation you get, if it's better or worse. Some people even say it stands for chance. And then, of course, people say, look, you have to see that this crisis also is an opportunity. And here is a very straightforward message for leaders who use this technique. You might be in a very comfortable position because you have a reasonable amount of money, you have a decent income, you most likely come from good or excellent education, you most likely have a network which will give you future job opportunities, and that simply puts you in a very comfortable position. The vast majority of the people who work for you do not have this position, and it's shocking that I have to point that out because it is, it is blindingly obvious, and still, most leaders do not see it. The last thing people want to hear now is that you say, see the crisis as a chance. See the crisis as an opportunity. An opportunity for what? It can only get worse when you sit down with people who you have to lay off and then you tell them something like, many people who were in the exact same situation like you are now were even greater after they recovered from the crisis. Or you say something like, people who have accomplished great things in life were in, a, were in the exactly same situation like you are now, blah, blah, blah. Motivational chumba wamba at its worst. We have to talk about how do you want to handle motivation in challenging times? And there are different aspects to it. So 
Aspect number one, and that is very important. Now, some people might have found this podcast in our weekly expert letter, and that's very important to the people who listen to this. Now, everything we do in a podcast is always more detailed and more intense than what you see in the expert letter for very obvious reasons. When I am going to write an article, which, of course, when you open the website says it needs 15 to 20 minutes to read, you will not read this article because you will consider it too long. At the same time, we saw that listening to a podcast of 10 to 15 minutes, and we always keep our podcasts shorter than 15 minutes if we can by any means, you will listen to this because it's easier to listen to something than to read through something. So um, step number one, when you want to be sure that you win your people sustainably in a leadership situation. Of course, facts are important and facts are never irrelevant. That is very important. So when you say facts, you sit down with your management team and you're going to talk about what the facts are. People in your team know that something is wrong. People immediately realize when there are less orders, when there's less to do, when there is less being sent out from the logistics department, etc. So the people immediately realize when the company is not doing well. They also realize your change of mood, the different kind of communication. And now there's, so first step, don't use emails to communicate what you're going to do in the future. Because what I often see now is that the management team sends an email to everyone, normally with a video of the leadership team or the CEO, giving the future outlook. This statement is not only completely artificial and blindingly obvious, someone reads it out because you can see that the eyes of the CEO go from left to right, left to right. So someone's reading it off a piece of paper or from a teleprompter, off a teleprompter. People also see that this statement, of course, went through marketing, through compliance, through the legal department, and at the end, there is nothing left which actually could be remotely or wildly remotely considered as formerly known as content. You give some sort of general motivational message and of course you will say that you focus on the customers, you focus on the future and you of course focus on the people because people is the most important, as the people in your organization are the most important asset. People are sick of that. People will not believe it because people too often realize that the statement does not reflect on the truth following afterwards. So step number one, stop the motivational chumba wamba. I often see that managers now, and we have the trend now in Germany as well, good luck with doing motivational speaking to a Northern German audience. <laughs> we, as Northern Germans, by standard, we socially distance by the mile and consider it comfortable. So <laughs> when you... When you go to these motivational events, let's just, I, I, I just give, give you one comparison. Let's just, because often people go to these massive events, thousands of people in a room, and then you come back totally motivated. After one week, you're exactly where you were before. Nothing changed, motivation's gone. And your reflection on that is, oh, I need the next motivational class. No, you don't, you need content. Let's just get another idea. I want to teach you the piano. And now I offer you a piano lesson in a group of 100 people. You would question my sanity. Of course you would. Even if I would say a group of 10, what about that? Even then you would say, no, no, you need a really small group to learn something very well. Okay. So why again did you go to this 100 people motivational stuff? There we are. So excellence always happens in small groups. The smaller the group, the more intense the learning experience is. When I look back into my career and I did public speakings in front of more than a thousand people in Washington, and when I then go um, down to larger workshops, smaller workshops, the most intense feedback I always got from people who had a one-to-one -one coaching. And of course, I deliver all these kind of works. There's coaching, there's training, there's speaking. Every time someone tells me, oh, I do speaking only, that's a nice way of how to put I don't have enough content slash knowledge to fill more than 45 and a half minutes. It doesn't mean that they're useless or worthless, especially entertainers can be great when they have the same content again and again when you like that content. But when you are in the knowledge industry, you should offer a bit more than just speaking, because only speaking will not change the core content, the core aspects of the business. That's what happens in training and coaching. So after you realize that you should not do the motivational stuff, step number two is you know the facts, your people know the facts, you have to pick them up with their emotions. Don't do the PowerPoint slides showing numbers of before and after, or if you have to do that for whatever reason, after that you offer help for the emotional suffering. What is the help you can offer now? 
Can you furlough them? Where, can you close the gap of the furlough payment to full payment? Can you offer that, um, that during the time when they, um, when they are now furloughed that, that you can offer some, some sort of help? When they have to get a different job, can you offer some sort of help for their children to get them to school or back? Or when the schools are closed as well, that they can deal somehow with their children all the time? Is there anything you can help emotionally? Because with numbers, you will only win the Microsoft Excel competition, if there is any. And you know, um, when Germans want to have fun, fun, what do, what do we do? Spreadsheets. That's a fact. It, act it, it actually is. Excel is great. And many people don't agree with that, but Excel is actually amazing. But if you're not competing in the Microsoft Excel Premier League, which sometimes I try to do, then, um, then you need to know that numbers don't win the people. The emotions win the people. You sustainably win your people with the emotions. And of course, numbers are important. But then, of course, you have to be very sure that you offer specific help. It's very important that the help is not something where you say, oh, we're going to look in the future, da 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 da, da and then you come back to the numbers. As, as soon as you open the numbers, and that is now step number three, so... Step number one, no motivational chumba wamba. Step number two, pick them up with the emotion. Step number three, avoid any kind of any kind of mentioning numbers which can be easily criticized. So when you say we have a lack of revenue, so you have to take cuts of your salary, the immediate response will be: Where are the cuts on board level? Where are the cuts in bonuses? Where are the cuts? Uh, where are the cuts in dividends paid out to shareholders? Where are the cuts when it comes to what kind of company car we have? what kind of office size we have, what kind of building we are in, what are the extras for the leadership team, uh, what about their kind of business class travel, what about their hotel accommodation and everything they get there for free. You see it can be attacked easily. So step number three, avoid these pitfalls. And then step number four, and that's the hardest one, you have, you must be able to allow emotions. And I know some people from the UK will listen to this and, 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 and think, after I left school, there were no emotions left. Look, I am Northern German. We don't have emotions because emotions are inefficient. That's how we handle it. So it's a bit easier for us. But when you have, and that is often trained to us, that we say, don't show emotions, it's unprofessional. Emotions are private. Emotions are something for, um, f for your home, which you can share with friends, never at work. You don't have to be a professional psychologist, and we plan to do interviews with professional psychologists in the future. You don't have to be a professional psychologist to know that constantly suppressing your emotions is not healthy. That is common sense, but unfortunately, not common practice. The main question after you now know these four steps, the main question you have to ask yourself when you the next day, maybe after furlough or maybe even tomorrow, maybe next week. The next day, you get back to your office. So you go on public transport or you sit in your car, look on the road or look on the sign at the train station. You hear the same sounds. It all feels a bit more normal than it felt the weeks before. You enter the office building and you go into the elevator. And in the elevator, you see this poster, the poster that marketing put up a couple of weeks ago where it says, we focus on the human being. You know, one of these motivational posters that is in there because it says that humans are our best assets or something like the client pays my salary. Every single time your leadership team said that we focus on the people, the question you have to ask yourself is, do you really? Your call. I wish you all the best implementing this in your organization. And of course, I'm here to help. Feel free to contact me anytime. And for today, I can only say thank you very much for your time.